I'm messing up right from the beginning. Chapter 41, verse 1. It says, now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. Now, rewind. Actually, uh, Dr. Andrew, Andre Rogers is going to do chapter 40 after lunch. And it's going to be a great session. But what happens in chapter 40? Remember, uh, dreams before that. It was a, a cupbearer and a baker. And, they, and Joseph had this divine ability to interpret the dream. And he said, hey, the, 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 the baker is going to die. But you cupbearer, you're going to make it out. You're going to be restored. And you're going to be reconciled to your position. And when you get out, when you get out, cupbearer, remember me. Don't forget me, right? And what happened? He forgot him. He forgot him for two full years. And Joseph is waiting for someone to come and say, hey, you know, get this guy out of here in two, four, two more full years. And the amazing thing about Joseph, first off, we've already talked about some during this conference, is this. Is for 13 years now, he's been either in, in slavery because of his brother's thrown into a pit, or he's been in prison. And he didn't lose his faith. He didn't lose his character. We saw that with Potiphar's wife, right? He didn't lose his, his, his walk with his Hebrew Jehovah God. And he stuck with it, and he stuck with his character. And that, that made him successful in God's eyes. That's the first point if you're taking notes. No matter what circumstances you face, never give up on persevering in character and walking with God. It's always too early to give up. And we need to persevere, guys. Because life ain't easy. And Jesus predicted that, didn't he? He said, in this world, you'll have nothing but health, wealth, and prosperity. <laughs> what did he say? In this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, because I've overcome the world. And we're to take heart. And we're to keep persevering. And we're to realize, as we've already been taught, that some of these things that are thrown into our lives are there for a purpose and a plan. And we're tested. We see that in Psalm 105 when it talks about Joseph. It says in Psalm 105 that God tested him for these 13 years with affliction, with fetters, with, with prison, with slavery. But he didn't quit. He never, ever gave up. What did Paul say at the end of his life? After he faced 2 Corinthians 11, all those things he faced, shipwrecks. You know, beatings without number. You know, scourgings. 30, you know, 39 lashes. He faced all that stuff. But what did he say in 2 Timothy 4, 7 to 8, as he concluded his life? He said, I fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. In the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, but also to all who loved his appearing. Man, let's be like that. Let's keep fighting the good fight, no matter what life throws at us. Let's keep finishing the course, man. Let's keep the faith, Amen. especially in these last days. We're in a war right now. If, I don't know if you've noticed, since COVID hit, and especially, it's, it's, it's a war on steroids against Christians, even in this country. So let's keep fighting. If the devil wants a war, let's give him a war. Amen. Let's keep being soldiers for Christ and keep walking in character keep walking in perseverance, and keep fighting the good fight, finishing the course, and keeping our faith. I think it was Churchill, after he got through the whole craziness of World War II and defeating the Nazis, they asked him to give a commencement graduation speech. And, he, and he, they were all anticipating, because he was a great orator, he's a well-respected you know, leader of the nation of England, he got him through World War II, he persevered through all the craziness of almost losing his country, and they brought him to one of these big institutions. I don't know if it was Oxford or Cambridge, but it was one of the big campuses. And he was to give the graduation speech. You know what he did? He was sitting on the thrones up there on the stage. They were all anticipating this great speech. He gets up to the lectern and he goes, never, ever, ever give up. Never, ever, ever give up. Then he went and sat down. Guys, we're not in a time right now where we're supposed to be giving up. We've got to keep fighting the good fight. We need Christian men that are not on a porch, like was said last night by Ken Graves or by John Randall. We're not on a porch just looking for the pleasures of this world. We are on a battlefield. We need to keep fighting. Amen? Amen. All right, so two years. Verse 1. And behold, it says, standing by the Nile... Pharaoh had a dream about this Nile, 
And lo, from the Nile there came seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt. And they stood up by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. This is verse 4 now. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. And then Pharaoh woke. And then he fell asleep. And he dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain came up in a single stalk, plump and good. And then behold, seven ears, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. And then the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. And then Pharaoh woke. Behold, it was a dream. Now it came about in the morning that his spirit was troubled. So he sent and called for the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And behold, told them his dreams. And notice, there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. So do you get it? This is the third set of dreams now that Joseph uh, is encountering, and we'll see this later in the chapter. Remember, the first set of dreams was with his own family. And he had these two different dreams where his family members, including his mom and dad, were bowing down to him. That's the dream that he got in trouble with his brothers. And then the second set of dreams, last chapter, we're going to see it after lunch, was the second was with the baker and the cupbearer. And notice, that, that was in twos also. And now there's two more dreams by Pharaoh. Now, question... Why is there two dreams in each set of dreams? Because these truths that God was bringing forth in these dreams were being verified by two witnesses. Remember the Old Testament, there's always two or three witnesses to verify truth. And so these two dreams are two witnesses of truth. And the truth was being spoken to Pharaoh's heart to the point as the leader of the most powerful nation in the world, he was troubled by this truth. He was realizing there's something about my country in these dreams I need to pay attention to. You know what, guys? God still speaks through dreams today. We're told that in Acts chapter 2, part of the last days and the pouring out of the Spirit is that young men are going to see visions and old men are going to what? I think I'm in the second category now. But, But these dreams that are being presented in Genesis here are prophetic dreams. What does that mean? They point to something in the future. And sometimes what God will do is he'll give us even dreams today that will give us insight into the future. And that's how God moves at different times in our lives. And we need to be open to that. You know, I was preparing this message, and I was working this message this last week, and guess what happened to Pastor John? I had some dreams. And one of them is a recurring nightmare that I have. This happened just a few nights ago. Right when I was getting ready with this message. And I wake up in the middle of the night, and this is a recurring nightmare I have, and that is this, that I'm in, in college, and I, my alarm goes off, but I don't hear it. I sleep through the alarm, I miss a final, and I flunk the class, and I don't graduate in time. Have you ever had a dream like that? And so I, I had this dream in the middle of the night. I wake up like this, and I'm so worried that I'm flunking college, and then I realize college has been 40 years ago. <laughs> what happened here? And so, just like Pharaoh, I go back to sleep, and a second dream comes up while I'm sleeping, and I'm sleeping, and all of a sudden I have a dream that I didn't, I didn't do, I flunked, I did a paper, but I flunked the paper, and then I, I, and I didn't do it well, I just zipped through the paper, I flunked on the paper, I flunked the class, and again, I didn't graduate in time from college. I woke up in a panic again. I go, oh, man, I gotta, do, I gotta go bribe that professor, so I gotta go do something. Oh, that was 40 years ago. And I started praying about it. I'm going, okay, I'm reading about dreams. I'm studying about dreams. God, are you trying to speak to me here about something? And I realized he was. And I, I prayed about it. And I think the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, the reason why I give you this dream about finishing your homework or about showing up for that final is because you're a pastor and you need to keep doing your homework. Study to show yourself approved, a workman who need not be ashamed, but rightly divides the word of truth. Don't get lazy in your last years of ministry. Do your homework. Don't miss the final. Be ready for the return of Christ. And God spoke to me through those dreams. And God will still do that today. But let's go on with our story now. After he gets this dream, it says, Then the chief... Uh, the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I would make and mention to you today of my own offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants. He put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief uh, baker, and we had a dream. Now, this is the cupbearer coming on the scene. He's starting to remember Joseph. 
because it's for his own good. And we had a dream on the same night, he and I, each of us, dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now, our Hebrew youth, youth was with us there. Notice how he remembers Joseph. He was Hebrew, and he was young. He was Jewish, a young Jewish guy, was there with us, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, and we related them to, the, to him. And he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came about that just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored, he restored me in office, but he hanged him. So he's remembering Joseph now because it, 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 it's going to serve him well with the Pharaoh. And he says, hey, back when I was in prison, because you put me in prison, there's this dude there that was Jewish, and he was young, and he perfectly interpreted my, the dream. And the dream was that the baker was going to be killed and I was going to be restored and brought back to my position. And, you know, he might, be, he might help you, Pharaoh. So it says, then Pharaoh, verse 14, sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes and put some eyeliner on, as according to Ken Graves, <laughs> he came to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And I've heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And then notice what Joseph says. Right, you know, underline this, guys. Then Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, what did he say? It's not in me, God. Or it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Got to see that. What's he doing? He's saying, any gifts I have, it's not me. God's behind this, and I'm going to give all the glory to God. Here's the second point. If you want to be successful in God's eye, first of all, persevere. Live in character no matter what life throws you. Second point, give glory to God for your gifts. If you're a good worker where you work, remember that the talents you have and what you do with your work is given to you from God. Every good and perfect gift is from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. Amen. If you're, a, if you're a good counselor and you give good counsel to people, you know why you have good counsel if you're a Christian? It's because the word of God has been given to you and you know the word of God well enough to steer people in the word of God. That's, that's for God's glory, amen? I mean, if you're good at anything, sports, anything, it's because God has given you the talent. Don't grab the glory from God. The Bible says very clearly that you know, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I like the, the job, job description we're supposed to have as Christians. Mike six, Micah 6, 8 says, God has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk. Walk what? Humbly with your God. First Peter 5, 6 says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Joseph was exalted because of his humility, giving all the glory to God. You know, I think it was Billy Graham that said, hey, you're never more like Satan than when you grab God's glory. Don't grab his glory. And by the way, God will deal with that too. You grab his glory and you live in pride. It says in Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. He'll take care of that. God's really good with that with me. Anytime I get prideful, he takes me down a notch. Oh, Pastor John, that was such a great message. Next service, I'd fall on my face because he has a way of humbling us, doesn't he? He humbles us and he humbles us when we get into pride. You know, um, Jesus said before, he, before his birth, there was one man that was born that was greater than any other man that was born before he was born. Who was that? John the Baptist, right? And what was John the Baptist? What did he say? Jesus must increase and I must decrease. That's what made him great in Jesus' eyes. And when Jesus came on the scene, it was all about the glory of Jesus with John the Baptist. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he pointed his disciples away to follow Jesus Christ. Because it was all about the glory the glory of Jesus Christ. And if we want to live great lives, lives that are successful in God's eyes, give glory to God with any gifts that he's given you. <laughs> my, my oldest son, named after me, John G. Hoppy IV, he got this thing in high school about wanting a tattoo. And I'm not into tattoos. Sorry, Ken, I'm not into tattoos. 
but I just don't like tattoos. I, I got a needle thing. I don't like anybody putting needles in me. Almost a phobia. So, so he got this thing at 18. You could go across the line, the Georgia line, to get a tattoo. And I talked, I did my best hoppy press to talk him out of it. And his little brother went with him, and they went to Georgia, and he got a tattoo. He came back, and we live on the lake and stuff, so he came back, and I'm going, oh, okay, well, you didn't listen to me. He pulls off, we go water skiing, he pulls off his shirt to go water skiing, and he has on the side of his ribs right here a cross, and it says across his side, he must increase, I must decrease. John 3.30. I said, can't hold that against you. <laughs> can't be upset with it anymore. Why would you have to get that? But it's like, and I see in my son's life a real blessing. A little blessing on his life because that's been his theme. As, as a young man that walks with Christ, he just wants Jesus to increase and he him decrease. He got that thing on the back of his pickup truck. You know, he and then the sign, greater than me. Or I, whatever it is. And that's been his theme in life, and God's blessed him. He's got the cutest little girl in the world as a daughter. And I'm, I'm biased a little bit, Grandpa Hoppy here. But he, we went all the way to Yellowstone with this little four-year-old this summer for a family vacation. She didn't cry once. She is the apple of my eye. Beautiful little girl. His wife's pregnant right now, too, with her second. God just blessed him. He's got his own engineering company up in Greenville, South Carolina. He's got partners in it. And God's blessing his life because it's all about exalting Jesus and not him. He's a humble man. God will bless us as we humble ourselves in his presence. And that's what Joseph is doing right now. He says, not me. God will give a Pharaoh a favorable answer. Let's go, let's go on now. Verse 17. So Pharaoh spoke to Joseph. In my dream, behold, I was standing on the bank of the Nile. And behold, seven cows. Here it's repeated. Fat and sleek came out of the Nile, and they grazed in the marsh grass. And lo, the seven cows, other cows, came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such as they had never seen for ugliness in all the land. These are some ugly cows. And the ugly, skinny cows are eating the, the, the fat, prosperous cows. And the lean and ugly cows ate up the fat, first seven fat cows, yet when they had devoured them, it could not be detected that they had devoured them, for they were just as ugly as before. And then I woke. Second dream. I also saw in my dream, second dream, behold, seven ears, full and good, came up in a single stalk, and lo, seven ears, withered, thin, scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them, and the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears, and then I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to him or to me. Now Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years, and the dreams are one and the same. And the seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven thin years scorched by the east wind shall be seven years of famine. Interesting. And so he's interpreting the dream. And he says, it is, it is as I've spoken to Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he's about to do. Behold, what's going to happen? Seven years of what? Great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt, and after them, seven years of famine will come, and all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine will be ravaged in the land, and so the abundance will be unknown in the land because of that subsequent famine, for it will be very severe. Now, as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God. There it is, predestined by God. We talked about that during our QA. God has sovereignty, He's predestined this, He's sovereignly doing this, and God will quickly bring it about. And now let Pharaoh look for a man, discerning and wise, and set him over the land. Now here's what Joseph's doing. He's going from interpretation to plan of action. And he's giving counsel to the most powerful man in the world. This is how you're to deal with the famine that's going to come. What does he say? Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land in the seven years of abundance. And then let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority. Let them guard it. And let the food become as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which will occur in the land of Egypt so the land may not perish during the famine. So you see that? He goes from interpretation to plan of action. And what's the plan of action? He says this. Okay, you're going to have seven years of abundance. You're going to have prosperity for these seven years. But the, during those seven years, be careful. 
and save. And save in surplus 20% of the, of the abundance. Because after those seven years of prosperity, what's going to come? Famine. And if you save 20%, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have plenty to get through the seven years of famine. So here's the next thing I want you to see. He was successful. Joseph was successful because he was a good steward, a manager, with a plan of action. And guys, especially in the times we're living in right now, we got to be careful and be good stewards. We're living in a prosperous time. We're living in a prosperous country. But we don't know what's around the corner, do we? We don't know what's, if a famine's coming. And the wise steward today does what Joseph does. We plan. And we manage. And we even save. I'm a Dave Ramsey fan. I know he can be rude on the radio sometimes, but I like the guy. Because he slaps people in the face and wakes them up to say, be good stewards with what God's given you. You know, I've been listening to him the last several years. I listen to his podcast all the time. Although after you listen to him for a while, he says the same thing over and over and over again. What's he say? If you're going to be a good steward, you've got the plan of action, the seven baby steps. And the seven baby steps you need to do if you're going to have a good plan of action in these last days, I think they're good steps. Here's what his seven steps are. I think we should all have a plan like this if we're going to be good stewards. His plan is seven steps, seven baby steps. Save $1,000 in a beginner emergency fund. Get out of debt because debt is dumb is what he says. My dad used to say debt is like the plague. Avoid it like the plague. Number three, plan of action. Save three to six months of expenses for emergencies because you don't know what the famine's going to come around the corner and the emergency is going to come. Number four, invest 15% of your income. What's that? That's saving. Joseph didn't do 15%. What did he do? He did 20%. Number five, save for college. Number six, pay off your house. Get rid of that mortgage. Number seven, build wealth. And then what we talked about during question and answer, give. You know what? I think most of America is not doing that. Most Americans, instead of avoiding debt, it's taking more debt on. In these last days, we need to, don't need to be doing that. You know, I've been listening to him for the last several years, so I've been, I've, I've, brain, I've been brainwashed by Dave Ramsey's seven baby steps, and I've taken that seriously. You know, it's really served me well, and it's served the church well, too. And so what we've done as a church is we've gotten out of all debt as a church. We've got these 10 acres here. We've got the 10 acres next door. We just built a brand new bunkhouse for our U-Turn for Christ, a block bunkhouse, for, and we're 100% out of debt, and we're going to stay that way until Jesus calls us home. We're going to do that. And, and we don't do anything now that involves debt because we want to stay out of debt. And I've done that with my personal life, too. I've worked really hard the last several years. Get rid of all debt. That's my plan of action. No more debt. Uh, you know, cut up those credit cards. Don't take on any debt. And we've done that. We've been able, as a couple, and, you know, I just turned 61 last, uh, a couple weeks ago, and it's so nice to have a plan of action that's worked, that I don't have any more debt. No mortgage, no credit cards. All my kids are married and working and got good jobs. They're off the payroll. It's awesome. There's a freedom. You know, the, 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 the borrower is a slave to the lender, amen? So let's have a plan of action, guys. Joseph was a great steward. He started in slavery, he stewarded the uh, uh, Potiphar's house, he's, then he stewarded, uh, managed the prison, and they, they saw that he was a good steward and delegated that leadership to him because he was a good steward and he always had a plan of action. We need to do the same, amen? amen? All right, let's go on now. Verse 37, now the proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and all his servants, and then Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? Notice, Joseph, they could see a divine spirit in him. I believe it was the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, leaders were given, not like us for the rest of our lives, but for at least a season, leaders were given the Holy Spirit to help them with their leadership. And I believe the Holy Spirit was involved in Joseph's life. And the, even the pagan world could see there's some kind of supernatural spirit working in this guy's life. And so Joseph said, or Pharaoh said to Joseph, verse 39, since God has informed you of all this, there's no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house. According to your command, and all my people should do homage, only in the throne I will, I will be greater than you. 
And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. And then Pharaoh, notice what he does. He takes off his signet ring. Signet ring was his authority. He says, I'm giving you, the most powerful man in the world now, is giving his ring to Joseph and saying, you have my authority. And, that, and then he also says, he put it on Joseph's hand and then clothed him in garments. Finally, he got some nice clothes. He's been living in a pit so far. Now he's, man, he's, he's, he's dudeing up right now. He's got some nice clothes put on, fine linen. And then they put gold necklaces, as was said last night. He got some bling around his neck. And notice, he had him ride, Pharaoh had him ride in the second chariot and proclaimed before him, bow the knee. And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Talk about a change. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall rise or raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And then Pharaoh named Joseph Zephanath. Pania, and he gave him Esneth, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, as his wife. He was Egyptianizing him. He was getting him in a position where all of Egypt would follow his leadership too by giving him an Egyptian name and also an Egyptian wife as his wife. And Joseph went forth over all the land. Guys, got to see this. This is lightning speed. This guy's been either a slave or a prisoner for 13 years. And in one day, he goes from the pit to the palace, man. It says he's in a dungeon before this. The word dungeon there in the, in the, in the Hebrew is this, a pit or a cistern in the ground. He's living in dirt in a pit. He goes from the pit to the palace. He goes from the outhouse to the white house. He goes from rags to what? Riches. Now, I want you to see something here, too. That Joseph is a type in the Old Testament. What does that mean? He's a, he's a type that points to Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of aspects of Joseph's life that he's a type that points to Jesus Christ. And listen, when, when he was rejected by his Jewish brethren, that points to Jesus Christ. And that was his 11 brothers were the 11 tribes of Israel, uh, the the. the that was what born from his brothers, and they rejected Joseph, type of Christ, because Jesus was rejected by his Jewish brethren as a whole. We also see that, that Joseph is a type of Christ because we see here right now that he's submitted to the Father's, the, to God's plan for 13 years. He submitted to God's plan, but what's the result of that now? People are what? Bowing their knee to him. And he's in a position of great authority. It says in Philippians chapter 2, right? That Jesus humbled himself, being obedient to death, even death on a cross. And because he humbled himself, took the cross for us, God highly exalted him that at the name of Jesus, what's going to happen? Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. See the type there? Joseph's a type. We'll see at the end of the chapter another part of him being the type of Jesus Christ. Wonderful, how it points to him. But I also want to see, show you the name there, the, the Egyptian name, Sephanath Pania. You know what it means? My, my actually NASB uh, study Bible in the uh, cross references translates this and says it means that God speaks and God lives. What kind of life did Joseph lead? He led a life where through his life, God spoke. And God lived to the point that pagan people gave him that name because they saw God speak and God live through him. That was his name. Man, that's another principle for being successful in God's eyes. Live a life where God speaks through your life and God lives through your life. I love Raul Reese. He's one of my favorite guys. One of the reasons I love Raul Reese is that dude's got some mojo. I think Jewish people call it Chutzpah. He's got mojo. So we got this low power FM station over here, and it's on the water tower for Lexington. We let the mayor speak for 30 minutes every week, and we get free tower rent. It's awesome. That was part of our plan of action. Free. I'm a Dutch guy. I love free. And so I was listening to our low power station the other day, and Raul Reese is on it, and he gave a part of his testimony I never heard before. He's talking. I heard the part about him almost killing his well his wife, and heard the part about seeing Pastor Chuck on the TV, and then 
you know, hitting the deck and coming to Christ, heard the part of him starting the Bible study at his Kung Fu studio, all that stuff, but I never heard this part before. He said that after he came to Christ, he wanted God to speak through him so much and he wanted to, people to see that his life was changed by God so much that he went back to his high school where he was a demon at, he used to beat up kids all the time and had all kinds of problems at the high school. He went back to the high school and there was this uh, L.A. school and in L.A. schools at the time they had lunch hour outside because the weather's so good and everybody would just sit at picnic tables outside and he went back to that school and he wanted to witness to the high school students where he went to high school. So he went back there. He's sharing this on our radio station. I'm listening. And he goes, and I went back there. And you know what they did me the first day I went to witness to the high school kids? They called the police. And they escorted me off of campus. I got a police escort off of campus because the principal and everybody knew what Raul Reese was like. And so he set up an appointment after that, he said in his radio teaching. He said, I set up an appointment with that. I can't I didn't imitate him well. But I set up an appointment with that, that uh, principal. And I said, all I want to do is share with people what God has done in my life and that God is living in me by the Holy Spirit. He's changed my life. And the principal just looked dumbfounded because he knew Raul Reeves. He knew how he was crazy. But he said, you know, if God's changed you that much, go ahead. Go ahead. Start coming at lunch hour. There's 2,000 kids at lunch hour out by the picnic tables. You could share with anybody you want. This is back in the 70s. That ain't happening right now anymore. So he went out. And he went out and started going every day for like three, four, five weeks. And all he did was personal evangelism and witnessing to people and trying to share Christ and what God's done in his life. And then after about three or four weeks, you know what the Lord told him? Get up on a picnic table and preach the gospel to these kids you've been witnessing to. He had seen it at Costa Mesa. He saw the power of an altar call and people coming to Christ. So he gets up on a picnic table and he starts preaching and people are throwing food at him. And he said during his testimony time, he said this, he said, I just about killed those people that were throwing food at me. He goes, the flesh was coming up. I want to kill them. And the Lord spoke to, spoke to my heart and just said, keep preaching the gospel. And so he kept preaching the gospel. And all these high school students he'd been witnessing to saw God in him. And God speaking through him. And he gave an altar call. 500 teenagers came forward that day to receive Christ. God was speaking. God was living through him. Hey, in these last days, guys, let's keep letting God speak through us. Let's keep being men of God that God is speaking through and living through so this world could be reached for Jesus Christ. And that's a part of being successful in God's eyes. We got, we got a mission, man. Go and preach the gospel, Mark 16, 15, to what? The whole world. Let's do it. Amen? Let go of the, okay, live a life where God speaks and God lives for you. That's the fourth principle on being successful in God's eye. Now let's go on. Let's see what he names his kids. Now Joseph was 30 years old. That's interesting, another type of Christ because he begins his leadership at 30 for the whole nation of Egypt. When did Jesus begin his ministry of leadership in this world? His public ministry started when he was 30 years old too. And it says, and when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. And during the seven years of plenty, the land brought forth abundantly. So he gathered all the food of those seven years which occurred in the land of Egypt. And he placed the food in the cities. And then he placed in every city, here's the plan, the food from its surrounding fields. And thus Joseph stored up grain. And notice, he stored it up in great abundance. He was saving like the sand of the sea until he stopped measuring it, for he was beyond measure. There was such an abundance of prosperity during the seven years that they Stop counting how much, how much food they had. It was, and then it goes on and says, after beyond measure, verse 15, now before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, whose names were es, uh, whom Esneth, the daughter of Potiphar, priest, priest of Owen, bore to him. And notice what he names him. Ken talked about this last night. The firstborn is named what? There is Manasseh, which means forget. And for he said, God has made me forget all my trouble in my father's household. And then he named the second one Ephraim, which means, by the way, fruitful, but it can literally be translated in the Hebrew, doubly fruitful. I've been doubly fruitful now in this land. For he said, God has made me forget all my trouble, all my father's household. And then second Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Let's do a rewind. 
Joseph was abandoned and deserted by his own brothers. Joseph had a lot to hold against those guys. Joseph could have been so bitter and so angry and so frustrated. Even after he was blessed, he could have just hung on to that. Joseph was put in slavery and then prison for 13 years. Man, he could have held on to that, couldn't he? But what did he do? He said, I got two kids. I'm going to name one. Notice Hebrew names. Ephraim and Manasseh are both Hebrew names. What's that tell us? He's sticking with his Hebrew God. He's, even though he's been through a lot, he said, I'm sticking with my God. I'm naming my kids Hebrew names in Egypt. And I'm going to name them now that. I'm going to name them Forget because I'm letting go of all that junk in my past. And I'm naming the other one Doubly Fruitful because I'm going to be so grateful for the way that God's blessed my life now. We ought to be successful in God's eyes, men. Listen, we got to let go of the past. Let it go, man. And then we got to rejoice in God's blessing right now. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord when everything's going right. No, no, no. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Well, you don't know what my ex-wife did to me. You don't know what my own kids did to me. You don't, you don't know what that boss did to me. You don't know what that friend who betrayed did to me. I'm going to hold that grudge against them. Question, is that how God deals with you? What does God do for you? I remember through Christ, I remember your sins no more. Amen? Even though your sin is a scarlet, you're white as snow, man. As far as the east is from the west, so God has removed his sin from you. And he tells us, Ephesians 4.32, this is how we're to operate with people. Be kind, tenderhearted to each other, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven, what? You. And I don't know about your circumstances. I don't know about your past. I don't know what people have done to you. But I know how God deals with us. And we're to be imitators of our God. And if he's gracious towards us, he's forgiving towards us, he's let go of our past, who are we to not let other people off the hook? And the Bible says don't have a root of bitterness in your heart because it's going to defile you, man. It's going to mess up your relationship with God. It's going to mess up your relationship with other people. And it's going to grieve the Holy Spirit. And that's in that section, as Ephesians 4, being kind and tenderhearted and forgiving, it's in the context of grieving the Holy Spirit. And when we live in malice and unforgiveness and just hatred towards people that have hurt us, we are grieving the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen? So let go of the past. Success principle number five. Let go of the past and rejoice in God's blessing right now. Let's close up our section now because I know you guys are getting hungry. It's barbecue time, man. Let's close it up. Verse 53, when the seven years of plenty which had been in the land of Egypt came to an end, the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph said, and then there was famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, you shall do. He's pointing everybody in the whole kingdom, if you want bread, where do you go? You go to Joe. You go to Joseph, he shall provide bread for you. And when the famine was spread over all the face of the earth, then Joseph opened up the storehouses and he sold to the Egyptians. And the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. And the people of all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was what? Severe in all the earth. Last thing I want you to see is this. Type again. He's a type. Joseph is a type. And if you want bread... For your hungry body in Egypt, what were they told to do? Go to Joe. Go to Joseph. Don't come to me, Pharaoh says. Go to Joseph, and he'll be the source for bread. Jesus said in John 6, 35, I am, statement of deity, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. To who, he who believes in me will never thirst. Where is Jesus born? Bethlehem. What's the name of that city? House of Bread. 
And just as Joseph is a type in other areas, Joseph is a type in that the whole world, if they wanted bread, they needed to go to the source of bread, and that's Joseph. And if you want bread for your soul, Jesus says, I am. I'm the bread of life. And if you're thirsty, you're hungry, and your soul, go to Jesus. And that's what men of God do that are successful in God's eyes. Last principle, hey, you want to be successful in God's eye, don't go to the broken cisterns of this world to feed your soul. Because they're empty, the Bible says. Go to Jesus. He's the source, man. He's the one that says, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. And out of your innermost beings will flow rivers of living water. He's the one that says, hey, if you're weary and you want to find rest, very simple. He says, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble of heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What did the boss say? <laughs> the boss, that great musical theologian, just kidding. He said, everybody has a what? A hungry heart. Hey, you got it. We all, and there's some truth to that statement. We're all empty on the inside without Jesus. But the good news is there is a bread of life. And Joseph was a type that pointed to the future bread of life for our souls. And that's Jesus Christ. And guys, if we want to be successful in God's eyes, don't go to money to find fulfillment. You know, you can't serve God and mammon. Don't go to anything besides Jesus to fill your souls. Listen, that's even true of our families. Sometimes I see in the church the idolatry of your wife or your kids. The best thing you do for your wife and your kids is love Jesus more than you love them. Because he's going to fill you with the fruit of the Spirit with more love, joy, and peace for them. If you want rest for your souls, go to the source of bread, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen? I love what St. Augustine said about this. He's, he said this. He said, God, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you, O Lord. Amen, guys? So what are the five principles for being successful in God's eye? No, number one, no matter what circumstances you face, never give up. Just like Churchill said, never give up on persevering in character and walking with God. Number two, give glory to God for the gifts he's don't steal the glory. Don't grab the glory. Always point up and give him the glory. He must increase. We must decrease. Number three, be a good steward with what? A plan of action. Number four, live a life where God speaks and God lives through you. Fulfill your duty to go and make disciples of all nations, preaching the gospel of the whole world. Number five, let go of the past and rejoice in God's blessing right now. And number six, go to Jesus to what? Feed your soul. Can I get an amen, guys? Amen. amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for another time that we could just be in your presence, Lord. We know that you are with us. And God, thank you for the humble confidence we could have knowing that not only you're with us, you're for us. And not only are you for us, but we're a part of your family, God. You've adopted us as sons of your, of your kingdom, God. We're so grateful for that. Thank you, God, that even though some of us had some real hard pass, God, we could rejoice in the present blessings right now. Thank you so much, God, that we got a source, and the source is Jesus, for rest for our souls, Lord. Help us to be wise, especially with all the distractions of this world, to always go to Jesus first for the peace that we need in our hearts. Lord, help us to be wise, too, as stewards in these last days. Help us to plan for for stewardship in regards to that. Help us to have a plan of action because we don't know what's around the corner. Help us be wise in that, God. Lord, I pray too that you'd help us to be men that no matter what we face, we're gonna press on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. As Paul said, we're gonna forget what lies behind and we're gonna reach forward and we're gonna press on to that call that you've given us on all our lives, Lord. Father, help us not to give up on the dreams you've given us. Help us to keep pursuing those things you've called us to do for your kingdom and your glory until you take us home, Lord. And Father, I pray for our food now, too. I pray you'd bless our fellowship and the food. Just give us a great time as men of God together for the next hour and a half. Give us good fellowship, Lord. And we thank you for all your provision, your grace, and your love. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name and all of God's men said.